Imagine for a moment that you are biting into a slice of freshly baked apple pie. Except today, your nose is congested due to a cold. So you're disappointed to find that the pie has lost its normally delicious taste. But why is it that a congested nose changes the way foods taste? Well, it turns out that often when we think we are tasting something, we are actually perceiving its flavor. And flavor is the combined sensations of both taste and smell. The perception of flavor does not arise inside of our taste buds, nor inside of our nose. Rather, it is a creation of our brains. As a neuroscientist, I want to understand how our brains create our perception of reality, in particular, flavor perception. And I have dedicated my PhD work to exploring this question. But how can we even begin to understand flavor perception when our brains are comprised of nearly 100 billion brain cells, or neurons, that are tightly packed together and constantly communicating with each other using a language of electric impulses that we barely understand. Instead, we need to turn to the brain of an organism with only a minuscule fraction of the number of neurons in its brain compared to ours, yet that is still organized on the same basic principles as our brains. An organism in which we can use genetic tools that allow us to monitor and manipulate the activity of individual neurons so that we may understand how they create flavor. Enter the fruit fly larva. I decided to turn to the larva for my research because not only do their tiny brains have many similarities to ours, but these creatures are also voracious eating machines. They are constantly using their senses of smell and taste to find the most nutritious region in their environment. But do they actually combine the senses of smell and taste to perceive flavor? Well, to find out, I developed an experimental approach in which I could measure flavor perception in the larvae based on their efficiency at navigating towards a potential food source. I placed larvae in the center of an arena and created a gradient from a low to a high concentration of either an attractive smell, an attractive taste, or the combination of the attractive smell and taste. And I recorded their behavior. I repeated these experiments many times until I had recorded the behavior of hundreds of larvae in each condition. What I found is that when only the smell or taste gradients were provided alone, the larvae would meander a lot, but eventually they would find their way to the highest concentration of either stimulus. When both the taste and smell gradients were placed together, the larval navigation nearly doubled compared to either stimulus alone. So these results suggest that somewhere in the larva's tiny brain, it's able to combine smell and taste to improve its navigation towards a potential food source. But how does its brain do this? To find out, I used a microscope setup in which I could peer into the pinpoint-sized brain of the larva that was placed in a device called a microfluidic chip, a small chamber with an array of channels. Using this setup, I could deliver various concentrations of smell and taste solutions into this chip, which was custom designed in our lab. Within the chip, the different stimuli would get mixed together and could be directed to flow past the larva's nose and mouth. At the same time, I could record the activity of neurons in its brain using fluorescent proteins that would glow brighter and brighter the more active the neurons became. Using genetic tools, I could target specific cells to see whether and how they respond to smells, tastes, or mixtures of the two. I spent many months in a dark room 
peering into a microscope and systematically recording the activity of different neurons in the larval brain in response to smells, tastes, and mixtures. I found several neurons that were located at the entryway of the brain that responded and changed in activity to both smells and tastes. Surprisingly, these neurons were right at the entryway in a region that we had previously thought only coded information about smells. So for the first time, these recordings indicate that these primarily smell-responsive neurons can also be modulated by tastes. Now, for a long time, neuroscience textbooks have indicated that smell and taste signals first travel separately before being combined deep within the brain to create flavor. But this classic textbook depiction may be incorrect. My results, as well as recent studies in mammals, instead suggest the idea that there is a lot more crosstalk at early stages of sensory processing than was previously thought. And this early convergence may not just be true for taste and smell, but also for sounds and sights, temperatures and smells, and taste and touch, just to name a few. So by studying the tiny brain of a fruit fly larva, we can learn valuable lessons about how the brain functions. And it's important that we understand how the brain functions so that we may potentially be able to repair it when it malfunctions. But there are still many unanswered questions. For example, how do internal states, such as hunger, change flavor perception? How are flavors encoded as memories? And how do they motivate us to eat more, even when we may feel full? Ultimately, our experiences and our desires are a d direct result of the activity of neurons in our brains. Understanding where and how those realities are created within our brains may be the key to a better and more flavorful life. Thank you.